Good morning. Welcome to God's house today. It's great to have you here. In our worship these weeks in August and September, we're talking about the kind of church that God wants. And today's theme may seem self-evident that God wants a church that really knows Jesus. But, of course, it can be very, um, very uncommon for people sometimes to know Jesus and who he really is and what he's really like. So I want to focus on that today and really know Jesus uh, as a God of forgiveness and love, uh, but also a God who takes sin seriously. We'll begin our worship with our opening hymn. It's hymn 779, I Sing As I Arise Today. May God bless our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, Gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated, and the children are invited to come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning. How is everyone today? Good? Good to hear. So in our gospel reading later on, we're going to hear Jesus give a, not Jesus, Peter give a confession of his faith in Jesus. Jesus is going to ask him, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter confesses Jesus to be the Christ, the Savior. And then later on, we're going to say a longer confession of our faith called the Apostles' Creed. Can you say Apostles' Creed? Very good. That's a longer confession of our faith uh, that has three parts, one for God the Father, one for God the Son, one for God the Holy Spirit. And it's three parts because God is three, and yet it's one creed because God is one. Okay? Okay. But today I want to teach you about a much shorter creed, sometimes even an unspoken confession of faith. You know what it looks like? It looks like this. What's that a picture of? A fish, yeah. It's a picture of a fish. Maybe you've seen uh, on someone's car as you're driving, maybe you see this symbol on the back of their car at times. It's actually a Christian symbol. Uh, it's, it's the Christian fish. And you might wonder, why exactly did the fish symbol ever become part of a confession of faith in Jesus Christ? And the reason for that is because back when Christianity was illegal and you could be in trouble with the government for being Christian, uh, Christians had kind of secret ways to confess their faith to each other. And the fish became one because, you see, If you take the first letter of the name Jesus in Greek, it looks like this, like our I. Then the first letter of the word um, Christ in Greek looks like our X. And the first letter of the word God looks like this. It's like an O with a line through it. Then the first letter for the word Son is a U in our language, then the last letter for the word Savior is this letter. And this word in a different language actually means, can you read that? Fish, yeah. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So for that reason, people would draw a fish to confess their faith in Jesus Christ. Because they were saying, Jesus Christ is God's Son and my Savior. And that's our confession too, isn't it? We believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son and that He's our Savior from our sins. Now the question is, how do we come to believe that? Is it because we're smarter than other people? No. It's because God the Holy Spirit has worked this faith in our hearts by the power of his word and by the power of his sacrament. That faith has worked into us so that we too confess Jesus Christ to be God's son and our savior. And we can give thanks for that. 
So as we hear Peter confesses faith later on, and as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, let's rejoice that God has brought us to believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our Savior and for coming to earth to save us from our sins. Keep us always in the faith and keep us faithful to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34. It's a foundational section of the Old Testament where the Lord himself gives a sermon, an explanation of his saving name, the Lord. It's also the basis for the sermon this morning. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. The word of the Lord. We now speak Psalm 138 responsively. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name. When I called, you answered me. Though the Lord is exalted, though lofty, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. The Lord will vindicate me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Our second reading today is from Paul's epistle, his letter to the Romans, chapter 10. In this section of Romans, Paul is comparing the righteousness that is by the law with the righteousness that is by faith. And he makes the point that uh, when it comes to righteousness by faith, uh, it is our hearts that believe and our mouths that profess that faith, and thus we are saved. We read from Romans 10. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, 
the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel appointed for this day is the story of St. Peter's Confession of Christ, recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we give our attention and our meditation to the words of our first reading today, let's ask for God's blessing on our meditation and prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord our God, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Who do people say I am? That was the question that Jesus posed to his disciples in our gospel reading. And there were some complimentary answers that were given, but there was only one right answer to that question, and it's the answer that St. Peter gave when he said, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But it might kind of strike us as odd that Jesus wanted his disciples to keep his identity secret at that point in his ministry. Did you catch that at the end of the lesson? That we're told that Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the Christ. And that strikes us as odd because we'd think that he'd want his identity to be spread throughout so that all might believe in him at this point. And certainly Christ must have wanted all to believe in him at this point, but it seems possible that he said this because he wanted people of his day to believe he was the Messiah because of his own preaching and his own acts of of mercy and his miraculous power. He wanted people that day to, to know that he was the Messiah, not because the disciples told him so, but because they heard it from himself, his own preaching, and from, the, from his own actions that he, was, that he was doing throughout Judea and Galilee and the whole area. But while Jesus is quite guarded about his identity in our gospel reading, we see how the Lord is not guarded at all. In fact, he's quite open about his identity in our first reading for today from Exodus 34. Yes, if the question that that drives our first reading is that question, who do people say I am? The question that drives our first reading is this one. Who does God say he is? We have the answer for that in Exodus 34. As we begin meditating on our first reading for today, let's, let's first of all realize that, that we're about to tread on, on some very holy ground. This is a foundational section of the Old Testament where the Lord himself gives a sermon on the meaning of his own name, of his saving name. And he also tells us who he is and, and what he's all about. So just like Moses did when he was before the burning bush, he took his sandals off because he was standing on holy ground, so we also should take off our sandals, spiritual sandals, so to speak, because we're treading on holy words here in Exodus 34. It can be helpful to understand the historical context in which the Lord gave this sermon on his saving name. Of course, we're in Exodus chapter 34, and the book of Exodus is all about the Israelites' exodus from slavery in Egypt. The first four chapters of Exodus introduce Moses, uh, the Lord's chosen deliverer. And Exodus chapters 5 through 12 tell the account of when Moses went to Pharaoh in Egypt and said, the Lord says, let the people go. And how Pharaoh said, no, no. And then how God sent those ten plagues on the nation of Egypt. Ten plagues that decimated the Egyptians and and brought them to their knees. And the last of those plagues is the plague on the firstborn, which is connected with the first Passover. It's after that plague 
that Pharaoh finally says, fine, leave, get out of here. And so that very night, the Israelites leave Egypt and are freed from their slavery and begin their journey to the promised land of Canaan. But then, of course, Pharaoh changes his mind. And he decides to pursue the Israelites and try to re-enslave them. And the account of that is found in Exodus 13 through 15. And at the end of that section, uh, Pharaoh has the Israelites hemmed in. He's got his army on one side and the Red Sea on the other. But you know what happens. The Lord causes the water of the Red Sea to part. And the Israelites cross on dry ground. And then when they're all on the other side of the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army is pursuing them through the Red Sea, that's when the Lord causes the waters to come back together. And the Egyptians are caught in a trap. And the army is destroyed. Along with any chance that Pharaoh had of re-enslaving the Israelites. And then in chapters uh, 18 and 19, you have the, the journey of the Israelites to that holy mountain called Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. And it's there where the Lord begins this special covenant with the Israelites. The Lord speaks to the, the camp of people, the Ten Commandments himself, and he, he tells them, if you obey my covenant and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Though the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then Moses goes up Mount Sinai and receives further instruction for how to carry out this special covenant. And all that he learned from the Lord is recorded for us in, in Exodus 21 through 31. While the people, the Israelites, were down in the camp at the foot of Mount Sinai. You probably remember what took place while Moses was up on Mount Sinai and the people were encamped below for those 40 days and 40 nights, right? Towards the end of that period, that, that's when the Israelites, with the help of Aaron, Moses' brother, they fashioned an idol in the shape of a calf and began to worship it as their god. And so that means that within six weeks of beginning this special covenant with the Lord, the Israelite people had, had broken the Lord's covenant in the most heinous way possible through idolatry. And as you can read about in Exodus 32, Moses comes down the mountain and of course he is ticked. And even furthermore, the Lord is ticked, right? And in Exodus chapter 33, you have like the aftermath of the golden calf incident. Because you have the Lord as he's there. Uh, he's just not sure what to do with these people. And he's telling Moses and, and the Israelites, I may not go with you on the rest of your journey to the promised land. I'm just going to stay right here. You guys can go by yourselves. Because I might destroy you on the way with how you're acting. It's in this section that we actually hear the Lord, I'm sorry, Moses um, praying these great prayers of intercession. And, and we see him at his best, interceding for the Israelites, pleading for the Lord's mercy to forgive their great transgression. He even pleads that the Lord would go with them on their journey. He says, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. We can't go without you, right? And it's in the midst of all of this, in the aftermath of the golden calf incident, that what we heard about in our first reading takes place. On the heels of this great transgression of the golden calf incident, and amidst Moses' great intercession on the Israelites' behalf, that's when the Lord chooses to reveal 
his saving sermon on his saving name, the Lord. For Moses to know, for the Israelites to know, and for us to know. And is it not amazing? We're told that that the Lord came down in the cloud and he stood there on Mount Sinai with Moses and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. One of the big questions in this section of Exodus is, is how could the Lord forgive the Israelites for their blatant idolatry? Well, the answer, of course, is is right here, isn't it? He could forgive the Israelites because that's exactly who the Lord is. The Lord, the Lord, he's a compassionate God. Think of the compassion that, that a mother has for her child and that deep, visceral, emotional connection. That times a zillion and more is the kind of compassion that the Lord has for us. He's the compassionate God. He's also the gracious God. He's a God who is entirely characterized by by active love, by faithful love. If the compassion of a mother mirrors his compassion, well then the Lord's active love, his grace, his his faithful love, that is mirrored by a good father. That sort of love. It's the kind of active, faithful love uh, that will fight for you and, and go to bat for you and take a bullet for you. That times a zillion is the kind of love that God has for us. And he's also slow to anger. He's not reckless. He doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't use a a bomb to kill a bee. No, he's slow to anger. It takes a lot to set him off. He has a long fuse, not a short fuse. Although we sometimes think the contrary, isn't it true that, that to, to have a, a short fuse is to be weak? And to have a long fuse is actually to be strong? Isn't that the truth? Well, that's the Lord. He is slow to anger. He has a long fuse, the longest of all. He's also abounding in love and faithfulness. When it comes to his love and faithfulness, he's not like this damp rag that you really got to like ring to get something out of it. No, he's like this gushing spring that gushes forth love and faithfulness over and over and more and more. It's gushing, gushing, gushing. Went to Niagara Falls this summer for the first time in many years and you just think about all the water that pours over those falls, and it never stops. It just keeps coming. Perhaps a great illustration of God's love and faithfulness. It abounds. It just keeps coming. Because that's who he is. 
Also, he says he delights uh, to maintain love to thousands, to thousands of people. Well, how can he possibly maintain love to thousands and thousands of people? People are a pain, right? Well, it's because he delights to be a God of forgiveness. He's a God of forgiveness. He forgives it all. He forgives wickedness. He forgives rebellion. He forgives sin. It's who he is. And isn't this the God that we ourselves have come to know? This God, this compassionate, gracious God who's slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness and maintains love to thousands, forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin, isn't this the God that we ourselves have come to know? Because while the big question in Exodus is how could the Lord forgive the Israelites for their transgression against him, isn't the big question of our lives, really, how can God forgive me for my wickedness and my rebellion and my sin? And the answer for us is the same as it was for the Israelites. It's because... That's exactly who God is. He's the compassionate God. More compassionate than a mother. He's the gracious God with more faithful, active love than a father. He's slow to anger and patient even with us in our weakness and rebellion and sin. Yes, he... He is abounding in love and faithfulness to all of us. And yes, he even forgives our wickedness, our rebellion, and our sin. He forgives it all. Because that's who he is. But even as God is that, he tells us that he's also more. He says this about himself too. He says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So yes, he is a God of compassion and grace, a God who is abounding in love and faithfulness and who's slow to anger and who forgives and forgives and forgives but he also states that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He does not do that. Now, to us, that seems contradictory, doesn't it? I mean, how can you forgive the guilty, but then also not leave the guilty unpunished? To our logic, you do one or the other. You, you, you can't do both. It's contradictory, right? Right? And yet, that logical problem that we have is actually solved in this. Is it not? If you want proof that the Lord does not leave the guilty unpunished, then look to the cross of Christ. And there see the one who took the sin of the world and the guilt of all and endured God's lightning bolt, wrath, in our place. Look to the cross of Christ and see that God does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes sin perfectly, wholly, and justly. But if you want proof that, that the Lord forgives wickedness and rebellion and sin yes, even your wickedness and rebellion and sin, then look to the cross of Christ and see God's statement that your sin in Christ is forgiven and your guilt paid for and that in Christ he maintains love to thousands. Yes, even you and even me. That apparent contradiction is solved 
in the cross of Christ. And though the cross of Christ is foolishness to many, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we, we must admit that the Lord's sermon on his name here ends with a stern warning. And we dare not ignore that or minimize that. The truth is that just as passionate as God is about forgiving sin, he's also equally as passionate about not leaving the guilty unpunished. It's who he is. And so that's something to take to heart today. It's important to take to heart today that, that if you think that, that God's forgiving and forgiving and forgiving nature can be taken advantage of, you're dead wrong. If you think that, that God's forgiveness is a license to just keep sinning because they'll be forgiven for it anyway, you're dead wrong. And you're going to find out exactly what the Lord means when he says he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And as he says, so will your children to the third and fourth generation. However you interpret that phrase, it's pretty horrifying. And if there was ever a threat that was given to curb evil, this is it, right? So brothers and sisters, take these words to heart. And through spirit-worked faith in Christ our Savior and in a spirit-worked fear of God, protect yourself, protect your descendants, Run to the cross of Christ and there find forgiveness for all of your sins, each and every last one. Because God abounds in love and faithfulness and forgiving love. And then having confessed your sins and run to Christ for forgiveness, don't run back to sin and continue living in it. No, rather live a life that reflects the forgiveness you've been given and the joy that you have in your forgiveness. And in the Lord, the Lord, our compassionate and incredibly gracious God. And for help in all these things, let's close our sermon this morning with prayer. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand at this time as we join our voices to Peter's voice and confess the Christian faith. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated at this time as we continue with the prayer of the church. We'll be using the Great Litany, uh, which is printed for you on page 10 through 12 in your worship folder. O God the Father, 
creator of heaven and earth. O God the Son, redeemer of the world. O God the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, three persons in one God. Remember not, Lord Christ, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forebears. Spare us, good Lord. Spare your people, whom you've redeemed with your precious blood. From all spiritual blindness, from pride, vainglory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all lack of charity, from all deadly sin, and from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from a hardness of heart and contempt for your word and your will, from earthquake and tempest, from drought, fire, and flood, from civil strife and violence, from war and murder, and from dying suddenly and unprepared. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, and by your proclamation of the kingdom, by your bloody sweat and bitter grief, by your cross and suffering, and by your precious death and burial, by your mighty resurrection, by your glorious ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, in our times of trouble, in our times of prosperity, in the hour of death, and on the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. Receive our prayers, O Lord our God. Govern and direct your holy church, fill it with love and truth, and grant it that unity which is in accord with your will. Enlighten all ministers with true knowledge and understanding of your word, that by their preaching and living they may declare it clearly and show its truth. Encourage and prosper your servants who spread the gospel in all the world, and send out laborers into the harvest. Bless and keep your people that all may find and follow their true vocation and ministry. Give us hearts to love and reverence you, that we may diligently live according to your commandments. To all your people, give grace to hear and receive your word, and to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Strengthen those who stand firm in the faith. Encourage the faint-hearted. Raise up those who fall. And finally, Give us the victory. Hear us, good Lord. Rule the hearts of your servants, the President of the United States, and all others in authority, that they may do justice, love mercy, and walk in the ways of truth. Bless and defend all who strive for our safety and protection, and shield them in all dangers and adversities. Grant wisdom and insight to those who govern us, and to judges and magistrates, the grace to execute justice with mercy. Hear us, good Lord. To all nations, grant unity, peace, and concord. And to all people, give clothing, food, and shelter. Grant us abundant harvests, strength and skill to conserve the resources of the earth, and wisdom to use them well. Enlighten with your spirit, all who teach and all who learn. Come to the help of all who are in danger, necessity, and trouble. Protect all who travel by land, air, or water, and show your pity on all prisoners and captives. Strengthen and preserve all women who are in childbirth and all young children, and comfort the aged, the bereaved, and the lonely. Defend and provide for the widowed and the orphaned, the refugees and the homeless, the unemployed, and all who are desolate and oppressed. Heal those who are sick in body or mind, and give skill and compassion to all who care for them. Especially today, we pray for two relatives of Doris Huffman. First of all, Phyllis, who is recovering from a broken bone, and Philip, who has been treated for stage four prostate cancer. 
We also pray for Jenny Campbell, a relative of Terry and Janet Johnson, and for Carrie Peterson, the sister of Carl Pine, as they also undergo treatment for cancer. We also pray for Lisbeth, Lisbeth Messerly, the mother of Trisha Gregory, as she continues to be hospitalized with multiple health issues. And lastly, Lord, we pray for Duretla Longstreet, the aunt of Todd Bukup, as she enters hospice. Lord, grant us true repentance, forgive our sins, and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your Holy Word. Hear us, good Lord. Lastly, Heavenly Father, we pray for all who were affected by the shooting that took place at the AutoZone in Polaris, where Andy Piranha works, but was not at at the time of the shooting. We pray especially for the family of the customer who was fatally shot in the incident. Comfort the mourning, heal the injured, soothe the distressed, and work through the authorities to bring the perpetrators to justice. But more importantly, work as only you can to bring them to repentance. And now hear us, Lord God, as we bring to you our private petitions. Son of God, we ask you to hear us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. Please stand for our closing prayers. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
warm welcome to all of you here in God's house today. It's been a joy to be here and to hear God's word with you and to ponder his saving name and what it means for us uh, as those who are saved by Christ, by grace, through faith. Thank you for being here. Make sure you review the announcements in your bulletin. Uh, There's plenty of things going on in the weeks ahead, so please make sure you're up to date on all of that. Uh, It's all printed there for you. Uh, And please, if you can, stay after for some fellowship uh, as we gather as God's people and make sure everyone's doing okay. Uh, Look forward to greeting you on the way out. God bless your week.